The day is in the midst of a year-long look at affordable housing in the region. What specifically do you think the legislature should do to help people who can't afford to buy a home or are struggling to rent an apartment? Well, it's obviously a complicated issue. You know, I'm the CEO of a municipality that has, um, I think, probably tripled the amount of uh, workforce and affordable housing it's had um, in my years there. Uh, <clears throat> affordable housing is it can be done any one of a number of ways. We tend to think of it more as workforce housing where we live because um, there it's a higher value housing market and uh, and most of the people that have moved in are either elderly or people who uh, are from the area, younger people, teachers, people who have more blue collar jobs. So we have uh, three models in town and I think that sort of covers the spectrum. One of them is a housing authority, which is elderly and elderly and um, elderly and um, uh, disabled, and another one is uh, um, A30G, a, a set of three buildings that were built by a developer near the S16 train that has 30% affordable, and then the third one is a uh, local nonprofit um, called Hope Partnership, and Hope Partnership has um, a board comprised of local people. Uh, they have an executive director now. They were out one for a little while, and that model uses local donations, some bank financing, as well as state financing. Um, you know, all three work and work differently in different communities for different reasons. In some circles, the 830G, I, I know the, Bob Stefanowski came out and talked about getting rid of 830G, and I think the key question is, if you get rid of 830G, what would you replace it with? Because that's part of the mandate to get affordable housing spread out into um, different parts of the state. That said, to me, housing is one leg of a three-legged stool that we need to make sure, give people the options to, to live wherever they want. But if you don't have transportation and you don't have jobs, housing just is not necessarily the, the be-all and end-all. So um, I think that any one of the three works. Um, there is risk associated with 830G, um, but I think it works in certain circumstances. And the other two models, which is the housing authority that's appointed by the municipality, or um, a local nonprofit, which is the one that I kind of favor, um, work. Why, why is that that you favor that? Well, I favor it because it's a bunch of local folks who volunteer their time to be on a board, to raise money, the, the communities that are impacted. There's a project in Old Saybrook, there's a project in Essex, they're ribbon cutting on a project in Madison. It's got its very local feel to it because it's people very close to the ground. It's not some investor coming in. It's people who've dedicated a lot of time and effort to working on a project. And because it's got a local component to it, it shows community buy-in. You know, by far not unanimous within a community, but in our project in Essex, which was a repurposed commercial building that um, was never successful, built in the 19, late 80s, I think. Um, they've repurposed the building, so the first floor stayed commercial, commercial commercial office and the second and third floor became residential. I think there's 18 units and um, it's 100 percent affordable um, but as you know affordable the definition of affordable is different by community so um, so it, it's filled up it, it does very well it's a beautiful project there was a significant amount of state money but because it's got this local control it solves the problem that a lot of people have raised about affordable housing which is you know big money coming in and just taking advantage of statutes i did not find that with the 830g contractor who came in he did a really good job and he's been very responsive when I've called him about people who may need housing. But, um, but the local control piece feels right for you know communities like ours, where you have multi-layers multi of investment within the community, the bank, the, the donors, the board members. So I, I kind of like that. 
And another topic that's obviously been been a big one uh, recently is is the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And for Connecticut, you voted in in favor of the bill providing protections for people uh, receiving reproductive health care uh, in the state. So a few questions on that. What what's your response to some of the concerns we heard from people who voted against it about? both infringing upon other states' laws and also about the uh, safety elements of expanding who can provide surgical abortions? Well, I think there's two very, very different questions there. I think yeah. the medical profession component of that and, and certain members of the caucus that I'm in raise concerns about expanding um, who can provide uh, reproductive health care. Um, I think they have legitimate concerns based on the historic treatment of minorities that uh, were given second-rate health care. I think that there is a additional conversation that has to be had about the changing nature of health care in general, um, whereby we're getting used to uh, PAs and ARPNs providing more services um, in general. You know, they, they are now the frontline uh, caregiver for a lot of uh, professions. And um, in many cases, you don't see a doctor when you go for services. So I'm, I'm a little less concerned as long as the licensure process is appropriate and people are qualified that uh, people will get second rate care um, by having this expanded capability. On the other topic, um, I need to say that uh, I'm still brought to tears by the decision, um, the Dobbs decision. It just, it, it I, li I was 22 when Roe versus Wade passed. I remember, you know, the women's movement back then and how different the 60s and 70s felt as a time, an ideology, you know, a time of hope and a time of change and an expansion of rights and uh, an understanding that women were not second-class citizens. And in, in my opinion, Dobbs relegates people back to being second-class citizens, not having control of their, over their own bodies. And uh, I think that's an appalling decision on the face of it. Um, and it's an appalling direction for me, for society to take that. And I don't um, discount people's moral beliefs about you know, whether it's when life begins and whether it's murder or not murder. I just believe that the decision needs to be made between a woman, her doctor, and her conscience, and that's it. And I think that there are very few circumstances where I think anyone else needs to be part of that conversation. So, um, so I think uh, providing access in this state for people from other states is not a violation. If anybody tries to say it is from another state, the bill that we passed provides protections against caregivers here from being sued, and I 100% support it. And in the future, is there anything else that you would like to do to, um, to, to change Connecticut's law around abortion? Is there anything else that you think needs to be done? I think we've gotten it right. I mean, I think that, you know, this is, when we, when we talk about um, abortion, terminating of pregnancies when, you know, there aren't extreme medical conditions involved, life of, you know, mother, um, I think that viability is the point, right? And, on, you know, for better or worse, viability is a moving target with the advances in medical technology. So I think that we've defined it right. I think we do it right. I think that we provide great service here. Um, and I, I am open to uh, ideas for people in the public health world or, or you know, women's uh, rights movements to suggest other things, but I think Connecticut has got its finger on the pulse of what Connecticut residents believe is a good policy. And last question on that topic. Do you think that parents should have to be notified if a minor is getting an abortion? I do not. Do not, okay. Um, and then um, on a financial note, the, the state surplus has grown to over $4 billion. Do you support the decision to use some of that to lower the state's pension debt, or do you think more should be returned to the taxpayer? I actually think that uh, laws that are in place mandating that we reduce our pensions, uh, pension liability, are very important. Um, 
<clears throat> a lot of hay was made over the last five, six, seven, eight years about this long-term liability. Um, I think changes were made to the last tier of employees that came on to work for the state and their benefits and their retirement um, benefits are going to be significantly lower than earlier um, employees. And I think that that sort of creates a line in the sand, but the long-term liabilities that we've amassed that we were never funding properly, using that money for that is important. And that is not speaking against the idea that there are there's a great need out there, but I think I, I'm all about fiscal prudence and I run a business and I understand how you mediate between the immediate needs and the long-term needs of a business. Um, and I think that here we're constantly going to fight the battle between meeting those obligations, meeting the current payments, using the surplus, and funding additional needs that are out there. And I think that um, we've done a good job of it. And um, on, on climate change, um, how should Connecticut move forward to address climate change with regards to electric vehicles, wind power, and other uh, clean energy strategies? So I'm, um, uh, I think you know, the chair of the Energy and Technology Committee. I've been that for four years. I think in that time, we passed some of the most significant legislation that the state has ever passed. Um, um, sitting out the window looking at what's going on out there, um, incentivizing wind power, doing a procurement for 2,000 megawatts of, of wind power, <laughs> um, significantly raising the caps on uh, solar um, that can be produced or, or you know, placed out in the state, um, and passing the bill last year, the climate change bill that uh, mandates that um, we get to net zero by 2040. I think that those are all critical pieces that I've not only supported, but I've championed and fought hard to get those things done. But we've also taken a balanced approach because I, I, when I talk about energy, I talk about a three-legged stool here, and energy is a big driver in mitigating climate change. I obviously supported the Transportation Climate Initiative that was passed last year in SB4, um, and I had a lot of input on it uh, with regard to some of the pieces that were in there, because we, we are, we're in a very precarious position. No, nobody wants to pay more for electricity. Nobody um, wants to flip the light switch and have lights not mm. come on. So the three-legged stool here when when I talk about energy policy and it go, every every decision I make goes through this filter is reliability, cost, and climate change mitigation. And, um, and I think the committee in the last four years in a bipartisan way has worked to pass some of the best bills the state has ever had. And, uh, and I'm proud of it. And I'm proud of the fact that we worked uh, in, a, in a really great way as a team. I don't think any of the big energy bills that we passed that have worked to mitigate climate change have had um, any opposition to any extent. I think that no bill in the Senate took more than five minutes to pass. And to me, I like to think that that's a testament to working ahead of time to come to consensus on how to do this, that you know, listening and learning um, in a field where when you start in it, you're the least knowledgeable person in the room is complicated, and uh, and we work together. You know, Senator Fermico was a ranking member um, before I got there. He was actually, I think, a co-chair, and he was a big help to Representative Arcanti and myself, and so was Representative Ferraro. So, working together made a big difference. It didn't have to be a political issue and didn't have to be controversial. It just had to make sense and meet the criteria that we said. Um, all the while moving in the direction of trying to mitigate climate change, which is, you know, coming on the backs of one of the worst hurricanes, certainly of this century, and there will be more. You know, there will be more droughts, there will be more hurricanes. Climate change is real and it's going to impact everybody's life. No one will be safe from it. And, and so what's next for the uh, Energy Committee, or, or what, do, what you've talked about, kind of what you've done over the past two, four years, what more do you think needs to be done? Um, 
I'm thinking about what legislation we want to propose in, in discussions with Deep and with Pura about directions we think we need to go. Again, um, some of the things that we want to do um, may have ratepayer impact, and the only way I would do that because we have such income uh, inequality in the state of Connecticut is to make sure that we have programs in place that mitigate some of this impact, not only for the poorest of the poor, but for working poor, people who work two jobs, who don't qualify for a lot of the programs. So, you know, in, our, in the Take Back Our Grid bill, we put in um, performance-based rate making as one thing, and we put in low, low middle income uh, rates, which Pure is working on right now. So there may be some more stuff we want to do there. Um, and there may be some other stuff on, on other ways to make it affordable as we mitigate climate change. Um. Uh, and then a couple of questions on uh, election, elections and election administration. Again, we're, we're asking all of our candidates um, this one. Um, do you think the 2020 election was conducted fairly and Joe Biden won? Of course I do. Um, and then on, um, do you support early voting and voting by mail initiatives? I do. I think that um, expansion of access to voting is something that I've always supported. Um, <clears throat> times are different uh, than when the Constitution was written and some of the laws that are in there and the initiative on the ballot I think should pass. I fully support it. I think we need to be thoughtful about any laws we make if we remove some of the barriers that are in the Constitution. But I do believe that um, giving people the access to vote early and vote by mail is very important. It, it's, it's important to note that we're one of five states that doesn't allow it. And it might be four, actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah. I, I stand corrected. We are in a minority, minority. of states yeah. that has not allowed it. It's a great horn. Um, and and we need to be responsive to the needs of the public with, you know, people that have different work schedules, two, two parents and a family um, uh, with kids that don't have access to running around and going to um, vote. And, and uh, you know, the same thing, even though it wasn't something I would have done earlier on as a first selectman, the, the um, meetings that we have now are all hybrid. Um, that gives people who can't get out the ability to participate, and that's, I think, an important thing that's going to stick with us. It's a collateral impact of the pandemic, and um, so I'm, all, I'm, a, I'm, I stand on the side of making voting easier. End of statement. That's probably the best way I can put it. Uh, and so you'll, you'll be voting yes on the referendum. I will be voting yes. Yes on referendum, and you support. Um no excuse absentee voting? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then uh, last question for, for the video aspect of this. Um, I wanted to talk about your opposition to holding a special session to spend more money on low income heating assistance as Republicans pushed for. Um, you know, what if the federal LIHEAP funding doesn't come through or, or what if the funding runs out before the General Assembly is back in session? Mm -hmm. So obviously Democrats have been uh, long-standing supporters of making sure that people who are in that category who need that help get that help. Um, to argue that we are not the main supporters of that is ridiculous. However, everything from the point of that hearing forward is political in nature, and every move made by the other side was to make it look like we didn't want to help people and they wanted to help people. Um, I adopted, you know, I chaired one part of that committee hearing and uh, got a little testy at times. I gave, you know, the, the ranking members of my committee the opportunity to speak, um, even though that wasn't really required. Um, but it's because they're friends and I trusted that they would be fair and, and judicious about what they said, and they were. Um, but I believe that there will be plenty of time after the election to go back and do whatever we have to if Congress doesn't get us the extra money that we need. Um, plus the markets, you know, I follow the markets quite closely for energy prices. They, they waver and flicker all the time, but they've been trending down even since that hearing. <clears throat> and um, 
I don't think you can tell right now how much more money we would need. But I will, I will tell you that um, the movement that happened at that hearing, um, to me, was 100% political, and I don't want to play politics with people's lives and needs. Well, what do you say then to the Republicans who say the Democrats are being political by not holding a special session? I would say that they would do exactly the same thing. 